the problem with that model is the agency is completely screwed up because it doesn't have adequate manpower, doesn't have an adequate budget, it's not equipped to deal with the mission that we give it. And the funny thing about the pathway to citizenship, like if Congress actually approves that pathway and puts those 11 million people on the pathway to citizenship, like that agency cannot handle its current mission even without those 11 million people appearing on its doorstep. And so, you know, if we, it, it's the reason why it's going to be a minimum of 15 years for those people actually to become citizens because the administrative apparatus is not set up to really deal with it. And that's a problem in a lot of policy areas. Like, even if you get members of Congress to agree and address a problem, when it gets into the agency at the implementation, stage, the agency screws it up, and then people get upset with uh, the results. There's another hand up uh, back there. Um, I have a question about immigration. So from my perspective, at least, it looks like, you know, looking out to 2016, unfortunately, we are already starting the election cycle already. But Mark Rubio is kind of the Republican's golden child, um, you know, because he's a Latino, that all made up all those. Problem. So my question is, why, did, why are the Republicans not spearheading an effort on informing immigration when it seems like it would be more to their benefit as opposed to Democrats? It is more to their benefit, but the problem is they don't agree with Marco Rubio. Like last year when he came out with his version of the DREAM Act, many Republicans opposed him. He is a member of that gang of eight in the Senate along with uh, John McCain. Most House Republicans don't agree with him on that. They don't want to go even as far as he has. Like he supports the pathway to citizenship with the border security uh, trigger. They don't support that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a classic problem where sometimes political parties put themselves in a box. Like in the 1970s, uh, Democrats were in that box. They were kind of identified with big government and liberalism and pursuing uh, social values that were not uh, necessarily shared by a lot of the American public. It took, a lo it took almost 20 years for the party to kind of get to Bill Clinton, who then uh, kind of uh, promoted what he called a new democratic perspective, you know, a more centrist and moderate uh, version. Uh, of uh, those issues, and then the party started uh, doing well. Republicans are kind of in that same stage where they face a conflict between their own policy vision and the political dynamic. Some leaders, uh, i.e. those who want to run for president uh, next time around, they're the ones who are coming out and saying, man, we got to do immigration reform. The members of Congress who are coming from districts where their voters are not sympathetic to immigration uh, reform, uh, they're saying, the heck with that, I can do just fine. I can win re-election by having the same immigration uh, uh, policy that I have right now. So you're going to see a tug of war within the Republican Party, basically between the presidential wing and the congressional wing. And certainly those, uh, Chris Christie and uh, Rubio and others who are queuing themselves up to run for uh, president in 2016, they are going to be pro-immigration reform, although with certain limits uh, put on it. But the House Republicans uh, are not yet persuaded that uh, that's the proper course. There's a question right here. Yeah, you use the term uh, hyperpartisanship. Um, can you give us a definition of that and uh, tell us if you believe it's a problem? When I use the term hyperpartisanship, I'm uh, applying it specifically to the United States uh, Congress. When you look historically, you can basically look at legislation and the degree to which it passes with bipartisan support or whether legislation kind of gets jammed through on a purely partisan basis where the members of the majority party all vote in favor of something and the members of the minority party all vote against it. You can kind of chart that over the 200 year history of the United States and see kind of the ups and downs when basically everything is passing on a pure party vote versus periods where there's more bipartisanship. I'm not opposed to partisanship per se. It becomes a problem only when it prevents us from addressing major policy issues. Like certainly 
I think everybody in this room would agree that high unemployment is a problem and that we need to do things to address that. People certainly will agree that having a trillion dollar budget deficits are a major problem and we need to uh, change our, our budget uh, in order to address that. The hyperpartisanship is a problem when people are so oriented towards their party on both sides that we can't get to yes. We can't do anything on the economy. We can't uh, do anything on uh, issues that people care about. That's what I would uh, worry about and that's really what has been the case over uh, the last few years. Other questions? Right here. Earlier, earlier today, you kind of alluded briefly to how close the U.S. came to kind of starting a global depression back in 2008, and then recently we saw kind of the New Year's deal um, to kind of piecemeal the tax bargain together moving into this year. How much do you think, um, as far as the <coughs> Um, the markets, because some analysis has come out and said the markets have, said, have started to just expect partisanship and have overcome it. Whereas other analysis will point out that Washington is a direct impact on where the markets are going. Um, so just give a few thoughts on that, and whether or not you think, and how you think, I guess, that's going to change um, throughout the rest of this year. I mean, the biggest surprise for me personally over the last six months has been how accepting the stock market and the bond market has been a political dysfunction. Because I had colleagues a year ago who were saying, look, we have to address the long-term debt issues and the uh, budget deficit problems that we face. And if we don't do it, the bond traders are going to jack up our interest rates and we're going to become like Greece. It hasn't happened. Uh, and these were smart people who said that, economists, and it turns out they were wrong. Like our interest rates have not got up, uh, gone up. People still buy uh, U.S. Uh, Treasury uh, obligations, and the U.S. stock market is near its all-time uh, high. Uh, and so it's a little puzzling why we can have dysfunction on the one hand and political uh, gridlock, but yet uh, the financiers are basically saying, look, uh, the private economy is going to get better. It's going to be better six months from now than it is now. A year from now, it's going to be even better. And so they're basically saying, you know, somehow they expect Washington to muddle through. We're going to do okay anyway. The economy will recover uh, and uh, we're going to be able to sell our uh, debt obligations. So at least for the time being, those people who said the United States was going to be like Greece, it hasn't happened, certainly when you look at the bond market uh, or the stock market. Um, this could be sort of a practical advice question. Uh, not really a question, but an opportunity to share your opinions with us. Um, if you had to give the Republican Party and the Democratic Party a couple of pieces of electoral advice, what would those be? Uh, for Democrats, it's easy. Uh, don't overinterpret your mandate. The problem with parties that win elections is they always end up going too far. You know, we saw it with uh, Bush during his uh, presidency, especially uh, during uh, the second term, and we've seen some of it already from Obama and uh, Democrats. It's like when you win an election, and particularly if you win bigger than what people think you were going to win, because in 2012, everybody was saying, oh, the presidential election is going to be a cliffhanger. It's all going to come down to Ohio. Like, you people are going to be the ones uh, who uh, decide. It turns out Obama won uh, almost every uh, swing state uh, in the end and uh, got a much uh, bigger margin. The problem with that from a governing standpoint is if you take that too seriously, you end up being less willing to bargain and compromise with the other side. And, and that's a risk I think Democrats face. There are some issues, particularly on budget questions, where six months ago, Obama supported certain things like raising the uh, Medicare retirement age to 67 that he's really backed off now. Uh, so he's made some changes. Congressional Democrats are kind of less willing to uh, compromise. So that's the risk from the Democratic side. On the Republican side, the risk they face is continuing the strategy that they have used over the last few years, which is basically opposing everything Obama says, regardless of, of what the idea is. Obama took 
Republican ideas from like five years ago or 10 years ago, put it into legislation, and every Republican voted no. You know, their, the GOP strategy was if they could block Obama from doing the things that he wanted, they would look strong with the electorate uh, and would come across as being very principled. But they miscalculated because by the 2012 election, people saw that as obstructionism as opposed to political principle, and they paid a price. I mean, there are lots of reasons why Mitt Romney lost, but the negative profile that people, that voters had of Republicans and uh, how they had uh, played their hand in the preceding years was part of uh, that problem. It became very easy uh, given uh, the Republican uh, principles for Obama to, to portray Romney as uh, rich, uh, uncaring, and worrying only about rich people and not the uh, middle class. Republicans had kind of put themselves in a uh, po policy uh, box. So they need to break out of that. And it's one of the reasons why Boehner supported the fiscal cliff deal on New Year's Day. I mean, he knew it was unpopular uh, with his uh, constituents. Uh, he knew that there were many Republicans who didn't think that was the way to go. But he felt that he couldn't just say no and block the compromise, especially when 80 people in the Senate had uh, voted uh, yes on that. And probably the same dynamic is going to play out on uh, immigration reform. So what Republicans need to do going forward is to find a few areas uh, where they can work with Democrats, compromise, and produce uh, legislation. There are going to be other things where they just uh, want to hold to uh, what their line is. They want to draw the distinction between uh, their party and Democrats, and that's okay. But you can't do that across the board. You can't vote no on everything, including ideas that came from your own party. Voters saw through that in 2012, and that created a problem for Republicans. Hey, you uh, almost alluded to it earlier. I have two questions for you. First, in your personal opinion, do you think that we should have something along the lines of the Haster rule or the rule of the majority of the majority? And then second, do you think the Haster rule is dead? It is dead. And for those of you who don't know what the rule is, uh, Hassert was a past uh, Republican uh, Speaker of the House. And he adopted a view that he would only bring legislation to the floor of the House if a majority of his own party uh, in the House supported uh, that uh, legislation. Meaning he basically gave a veto that if a majority of his party didn't want something, he said, forget it. I will not bring that uh, legislation to the House. That contributes to gridlock whether that principle is coming from Republicans or Democrats. Uh, Boehner has already sacrificed that principle on the fiscal cliff uh, deal where the majority of House Republicans voted against uh, the deal and he put it uh, on the floor and it passed with a small number of Republicans and most Democrats supporting it. They're going to end up passing immigration reform on the same basis. So the, Boehner is obviously taking a huge political risk because he's basically alienated his own base. He's uh, ticking off people within his own party. Although I think it's probably not such a big risk because I think John Boehner is toast anyway as speaker. Uh, he can still be elected from his congressional district, but I'm confident in predicting this will be his last term as speaker just because people don't like the agreements that are being negotiated and will continue to be negotiated. So at this point, he actually is somewhat free of political pressure. He's really legislating for history. He's legislating for how he wants historians 10, 20, and 30 years from now to judge what he did as speaker, as opposed to going for short-term popularity and retaining popularity among his uh, political base. Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming out. I appreciate all your great questions.